everybody, it's Christmas time! A time for crackers and stockings and delicious ham and gifts for one and all. You can just smell the roasting chestnuts in the air and see those robins out there on the lawn. But actually, did you know that Christmas as we know it now is only a very recent addition to the Scottish holiday calendar? It's kind of the ultimate comeback story, at least as far as holidays are concerned. So what we're gonna do now is a look at Christmas, where it came from, how it disappeared for centuries, and how it came back to Scotland. So how did we get this holiday in the first place? And to be clear, we're gonna talk about the celebratory aspects, the aesthetics of Christmas. Other channels I'm sure can do a much, much better job addressing these spiritual or religious meanings. In the British Isles, many aspects of the holiday we now know as Christmas were adapted from ancient Scandinavian, Anglo-Saxon, and to a lesser degree, Celtic and Roman customs roughly surrounding the winter solstice. These include burning the Yule log, the giving of gifts, wearing silly hats, feasting, and partying long into the night, or nights. In fact, the word Yule, or Yol, was originally the name for an entire lunar month in the Germanic and Norse calendar. That's right, the Vikings essentially dedicated a whole month to celebrating and relaxing. You can find references to this in some of the sagas, especially in the context of a protagonist staying the winter at the home of a friend or an ally. Many of the customs started by the old Germanic and Scandinavian tribes survived right on through the Renaissance all across Europe. For most of history, they lived side by side with Christian observances, sometimes being enhanced with Christian symbolism. For instance, the 12 days of Christmas, the 12 tide, was officially established as a sacred time for both worship and celebration by the Council of Tours in 567 AD. However, it's pretty clear that this was putting a stamp of approval on an already established period for wintertime festivals. And you guessed it, another name for Twelvetide was Yuletide. Many of the old customs were just too popular to ignore. A lot of them revolved around sympathetic magic and good luck for the coming year. For example, if your family has ham for Christmas dinner, you can thank a Viking. The Germanic tribes used to hunt and eat boar, which they considered holy, at this time of year. Another wonderful custom was wassailing. The name comes from the Old Norse veshel and the Old English washal, meaning to be in good health, to be fortunate. The Danish-speaking inhabitants of England developed this greeting into a toasting custom. Wassail! With the reply being, drink hail! This practice is so old that the Norman conquerors who arrived in the 11th century considered the toast a distinctive native ritual. As a shared drinking ritual, wassailing bonded communities together and helped chase off the winter chill through the use of alcohol and tasty spices. It was an expression of hospitality, which was of vital importance to fragile agricultural life, and you can still find that aspect in modern Christmas celebrations. The Yule Log, of course, is another custom that stood the test of time. The burning log was meant to last through the entire time of the Yule, to represent the returning sun. For Christians, this became a symbol of the new age of light inaugurated by Christ. These and a whole slew of other customs were enjoyed for hundreds upon hundreds of years. That is until the 16th century. There was a new group of sheriffs in town, and they were about to crash the party. In the process of questioning all the various institutions of the hated Catholic Church, Protestants of many traditions also began to see sin and vice in the old holiday customs, whether they predated the Christian Church or not, and honestly, how would they have known the difference? Basically, they painted the Roman Church and folk culture with the same broad brush. By the 17th century, several sects of Protestants actively discouraged any celebration of Christmas at all. Whereas your average folks would go to mass and then party the rest of the time, severe Protestants felt any form of social activity on this holiday was not supported by biblical writing and was therefore a sin. John Knox was one such Protestant. However, it was his later co-religionists, the Covenanters of the 17th century, who really put the kibosh on the party. Putting it very simply, the Covenanters were the homegrown Scottish version of Puritanism. And in a law enacted in 1640, they brought the hammer down on Christmas. The kirk within this kingdom is now purged of all superstitious observation of days. Therefore, the said estates have discharged and simply discharged the foresaid Yule vacation and all observation thereof in time coming and rescind and annul all acts, statutes, and warrants, 
and ordinances whatsoever granted at any time hereforto for keeping of the said your vacation. The law was strictly enforced. People were hauled before the courts and the Kirk Sessions for celebrating Christmas Day in almost any way. Bakers were even banned from baking mincemeat pies. Shudder the thought. The same sort of thing happened in England under Cromwell. Of course, not everyone was in favor of these new laws, but few dared speak out publicly. Things got pretty bleak and, frankly, boring. Then in 1660, the Stuart monarchy was restored and merry old England got back to being merry. But the Presbyterian Church, that is to say the Church of Scotland, never lost power in any real sense. So how strict was it? Pretty strict. The 18th century Scottish antiquary Robert Jameson preserved the opinion of an English clergyman he knew regarding the ongoing suppression of Christmas in Scotland. Quote, The ministers of Scotland, in contempt of the holy day observed by England, caused their wives and servants to spin in open sight of people upon Yule Day, and their affectionate auditors constrained their servants to yoke their plows on Yule Day, in contempt of Christ's nativity which our Lord has not left unpunished, for their oxen ran wild and broke their necks and lamed some plowmen, which is notoriously known in some parts of Scotland. Now, I can't speak to divine curses being brought down, but this just oozes with contempt on the part of that minister. And yeah, these prescriptions were extremely serious. You had to work, period. The bit about women spinning yarn is especially telling. Since the very beginning, there had existed a Christmas time taboo against spinning. Women normally filled every moment they could with spinning thread for weaving, but not during the Yuletide. They were, shockingly, expected to lay aside their regular work and relax. Having a full spindle was even a show of good luck, as well as a reminder that, yo, I'm on vacation too, fam. So for the next 300 years, Scots simply went to work on Christmas Day as though it were any other day of the year. Mind you, I doubt people were very productive. But what is a stir-crazy Scottish party animal to do with no Christmas? Well, simple. Move the party to another date. Specifically January 1st, called Near Day, and more importantly, New Year's Eve, aka Hogmanay. Since this was an entirely secular feast, the church could do nothing about it. Evidence suggests, though, that the Kirk actually tolerated Hogmanay as long as it didn't lead to dancing. A few of the old folk customs from pre-Puritan days thus survived. For instance, various practices designed to bring good luck in the new year, such as first footing and redding the house. First footing, for those who don't know, is where a tall dark man with gifts of coal, shortbread, salt, black bun, and whiskey enters your home bringing good fortune with him. Redding is a winter version of spring cleaning, sort of sweeping out the old luck and preparing for the new. And naturally, everybody set things on fire. Several days were dedicated to the celebrations, and this was a direct inheritance from the old Yuletide. In Scotland, they came to be called the Daft Days, the Crazy Days. It was a revival and the preservation of the idea of a topsy-turvy, rules-are-on-hold kind of mindset that goes all the way back to the Roman Saturnalia. That's where the silly hats come from, by the way. The Daft Days lasted from December 25th through New Year's and into the first Monday of the year, known as Hansel Monday which was marked by the exchange of small good luck gifts. That word Hansel derives from Old Norse and Anglo-Saxon, meaning to give into the hand, by the way. So there you go. Scotland found a way to party on. But then, what changed to bring back Christmas itself? Well, if you have to ask me, I'd say it was Hitler. Okay, seriously, bad jokes aside, here's the deal. By the 1930s, radio was making the world much, much smaller. Even people in rural areas of Scotland could listen to holiday broadcasts by the BBC. Then along comes World War II. All kinds of sentimental programming is being produced to help boost morale. Plus, now you've got the Yanks in your backyard. The American troops were stationed all over the UK and especially in rural areas, and naturally they were enjoying their own Christmases. After the war, exposure to how the rest of the Western world celebrated secular Christmas just kept on increasing and increasing. And FOMO really started to take root. In the late 40s and 50s, big, sassy pantomimes appeared in theaters across the nation, even though rationing was still a grim reality. 
in case you don't know, by the way, pantomimes or pantos are these adorably tacky vaudeville style stage shows put on during the Christmas season. They're supposed to be for the kiddies, but let's be real, everybody loves them. Radio and then television broadcast these as well as other holiday programming. And yes, commercialism was a factor. At first, there was a pretty strong class divide. As wartime privations dissipated, the middle classes in Scotland, who had easier access to media and more spending money, adopted the English Dickensian-style Christmas. Meanwhile, blue-collar people were still saving their money and their energy for Hogmanay. But it was just a matter of time. In 1958, the Scottish Parliament finally gave in and made Christmas an official holiday. Today, Scotland embraces most of the modern Christmas customs, such as hanging stockings for Father Christmas, Christmas pop music, and of course, fairy lights everywhere. Seems they also especially enjoy German-style Christmas markets. So yes, again, commercialism is part of the story. All of this history means that Scotland has perhaps the richest winter holiday season of any nation in the world, and that is truly special. The bottom line is this. Winter makes people think about the fragility of life. That makes people want to embrace life, and that leads to parties. Since ancient times, we have always felt a need for hope in the darkness. And as social animals, we crave joy through togetherness. Is Christmas commercialized? Yes, heck, I feel that the Puritans even had a point when it comes to excess that leads to self-harm. But it's a small point. I think we can be both spiritually minded and fully engaged with the lighter side of life. If we're smart, we keep that balance all year round. But the winter festivities are pretty ideal for pushing us to seize the day. So, whatever traditions you choose to incorporate into your Christmas, make it your own. Make it fun, make it beautiful, make it memorable. You'll be following in the footsteps of countless generations. Thank you for watching. I hope you appreciated the storytelling. Uh, if you want more videos with Farby stupid costumes, but some pretty reliable information, check out our other videos on this channel. And by all means, tell us in the comments what you do to celebrate Christmas in your home. Do you have any Celtic traditions that you follow? Do you have any particular church traditions or food traditions or anything like that? We definitely want to know. We're always looking for more inspiration. In the meantime, enjoy this year's festivities. Merry Christmas and happy holidays to you. And happy Hogmanay!